What if I told you that China might land astronauts on the moon before the United States finishes its Artemis program? That's not science fiction. It's a real possibility. But the question is, does landing first mean China dominates space or is the US still holding the upper hand through alliances and industry power? Today, we'll compare the lunar strategies of both nations and uncover why the answer isn't as straightforward as you might think. Before we jump in, I have a quick favor to ask. We're just getting started and your support really helps us grow. So if you're enjoying this, please hit the like button and subscribe. Thanks so much. And now let's dive into today's mystery. China's focused march to the moon. Imagine a single country moving step by step, testing massive landers and rocket engines with one clear target in sight, putting humans on the moon by the year 2030. That's the plan guiding China's current space program, and every new test seems to push them closer to the surface of the moon in a very deliberate way. Their latest achievement involves a full-scale mock-up of the Lanyu Lunar Lander, a vehicle weighing 26 tons, which has already gone through a trial run to show it can safely handle descent and ascent simulations. A spacecraft of that size is not a light test article. It represents a real step toward carrying people down to the lunar surface. Alongside these lander tests, the Long March 10, the rocket that will provide the lift, has begun of performance trials as well. If these two vehicles perform as planned, China will have the main hardware needed to mount its first crewed mission to the moon. At first glance, these trials might look like routine milestones, yet they raise an important question. Does this tightly managed sequence of development actually give China an edge over the United States, where the Artemis program faces more complex oversight and recurring schedule changes? China's advantage may not come from technology that looks radically different, but rather from how the government structures the entire process. Decisions face fewer layers of debate, and the mission timeline rarely shifts with each election, in contrast to the shifting priorities that have shaped US projects over decades. In short, China relies on a crawl, walk, run system, accepting slower early movement in order to reach steady progress later. One striking example of this approach was the Lunar Lander testing facility near Beijing. Engineers there assembled a mock-up of the Lanyu Lander and hung it on support wires to simulate low gravity, then placed the machine in a chamber filled with artificial surfaces designed to mimic a cratered landscape. Cameras and sensors tracked its every move as the test team watched how the lander's thrusters and control systems responded to irregular terrain. These trials cannot perfectly reproduce the conditions of lunar gravity, but they allow Chinese teams to practice scenarios of touchdown and lift off repeatedly and at full scale. Analysts note that China often scans open source information from US Artemis publications, but unlike American companies that combine their work, China's engineers must rebuild every system domestically. They cannot rely on imported engines or purchase spacecraft parts, making their program both resource intensive and highly independent. This explains why their focus on the moon's south pole is so important. That region is thought to hold water ice in permanently shadowed craters, a resource that could be split into oxygen for breathing and hydrogen for fuel, establishing an early foothold that could allow China to build a long-term presence and gain leverage in any future economy based on lunar resources. America's web of power. What if more money, more satellites and more allies mattered more than planting the first flag? That is the position the United States finds itself in, because while China is sprinting toward the moon, America has built a platform that stretches across multiple levels of space activity. If you look at raw funding, the difference is striking. NASA operates on a budget of about $59.8 billion, which is roughly four times larger than China's annual space spending at around $16.2 Billion. That kind of money does not only fund rockets and landers, it supports research, technology development, and a whole ecosystem of private companies that depend on contracts with NASA to build new spacecraft, design equipment, and launch 
commercial missions. This massive investment spills into every corner of American space power, from planetary exploration to defense-related satellites. Yet with all that financial muscle, the Artemis program itself has experienced repeated delays. Launch schedules have slipped, deadlines for crewed missions have shifted, and doubts remain about when astronauts will actually make their return to the lunar surface. A viewer might ask, how can the US spend so much more than China and still struggle to move quickly? The short answer is that the American system involves multiple actors, each with its own priorities. Congress requests oversight, budgets go through debate, and NASA spreads contracts across states and companies. The result is progress that can appear slower and less predictable than Beijing's streamlined command system. What gets overlooked, though, is America's advantage in the web of satellites already in orbit. The United States operates more than 3,400 active satellites, while China controls around 541. This gap translates into superior communications navigation and Earth observation coverage. It also means American astronauts and allies depend on a broader infrastructure every time they conduct operations in space. These satellites form a kind of invisible backbone that carries signals, maps out landing zones and coordinates resources, making them as vital as rockets themselves. Beyond hardware, there is also the question of alliances. The Artemis Accords, which define guidelines for space exploration and resource use, have been signed by 24 countries. This group includes not just close US partners like Japan, Canada and the European Union, but newer participants in regions spanning the Middle East and South America. Each signature signals agreement on a shared framework, giving the US more than just partners it spreads American norms of how to behave in space. By contrast, China has not built a large coalition around its lunar program, leaving its future projects far more isolated. Launch capability adds another layer to this structural lead. The US operates seven active launch sites, ranging from Florida's Cape Canaveral to newer hubs in states like Alaska and California, while China maintains four. On top of that, American states are in discussion to host new commercial spaceports, ensuring private companies like SpaceX or Blue Origin can expand operations. The diversity of launch facilities grows resilience. If one pad is down, another can often step in. This is why America's position cannot be reduced to whether it plants the first lunar flag. Its strength rests on a foundation of money, satellites, alliances, and infrastructure. In other words, the United States exerts power less through speed and more through the networks it weaves around every part of space activity. But those comparisons only take us so far because the two countries are not measuring success in the same way. We need to compare them directly on strategy apples to apples, competing visions of dominance. When you strip away the numbers and start looking at intent, China and the United States aren't actually competing in the same kind of race. They're both on the same lunar track, but the finish line looks different depending on who you ask. For China, the vision has always been anchored around physical presence. Engineers and planners imagine crews operating at the moon's south pole where frozen reserves of water could support human survival and fuel production. Alongside that, there are proposals for a lunar navigation system, a sort of GPS for the moon, and in the long run that could lead to permanent bases, supply depots, and specialized infrastructure built to last for decades. To them, winning means establishing a foothold that can't easily be taken away. The US approach points in a very different direction. Rather than focusing on the geography of one location, Artemis is designed as a framework that can stretch across multiple countries and companies. The program revolves around creating technical standards so that spacecraft built on different continents can dock, share data, and coordinate resources without conflict. It leans heavily on private industry, companies like SpaceX and others that supply rockets or modules, keeping the system flexible and distributed. This, combined with international buy-in through the Artemis Accords, makes America's footprint less about one base 
and more about leading a set of shared rules and pathways for exploration. You could think of these approaches like two different metaphors for power. China seeks dominance through territory and control, being physically present at the critical lunar sites and making sure national systems take the lead. The United States, by contrast, pushes for leadership through collaboration and governance, less about who has boots on the ground, more about who writes the guidebook for everyone else to follow. Both strategies have advantages, but they imply very different futures for how humans interact with the moon. Think about how GPS transformed Earth. It wasn't only an American system, it became the world's navigation grid, shaping smartphones, aviation, shipping, and even agriculture. A lunar network, whether Chinese or American, could steer the world in the same way, deciding how spacecraft travel, where they land, and how bases interconnect. That leaves the real question hanging. Whose definition of winning shapes the future? China may take the lead with its presence on the ground, but the United States already holds the advantage in partnerships and rules. Which of those truly matters more in deciding space power is still uncertain. This leaves us with a sobering reminder in the conclusion. Winning the new space race is not really about which nation plants the first flag. It comes down to who sets the foundation for how humans will explore and use space for decades to come. A single footprint on the moon might capture headlines, but the rules, partnerships and systems built around space exploration could shape everything that follows. So will the future belong to one and country's presence on the lunar surface, or to the alliances and agreements that frame the journey outward? Share your thoughts. Does space power mean being there first, building partnerships, or finding strength in both? That's it for today's episode. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe so you don't miss what's coming next. We've got plenty more mysteries to uncover together. See you in the next one.